involved at all in organizing this. So this is such a nice event because there was a team from Cohere who met Teju and they've just been collaborating for months and they asked me to come today, but it was really lovely because there's so much community already. So there's so many of you who are doing this work in different places. So I'm just excited to be here. I know that you've just done this hackathon for a week and I know you're still busy with it. I honestly just wanted to share some of the research that we're doing and maybe ways to continue to be involved. If you want to, if you want to keep on working on language, um, we're doing this big open science project. So I asked Teju and I asked Louise who helped organize this. I'm like, would this be interesting? Like maybe people after this hackathon, maybe some things have piqued their interest. Would they be interested in continuing and maybe doing some more research? So I'll tell you about a project that honestly has been so close to my heart for the last four months. It's such a group of like cross institutional collaborations that are working on this. But I think it's one of the most important problems to work on right now for research. And so maybe I'll share it and I would love to, for those of you who are interested, I'm, I'll, I'm happy to stay uh, after this for an hour because I'd love to get your feedback on the project because this is a project in motion. So sometimes researchers only share their projects when it's done, when it's a PDF, when it's like finished. So this is a different, I'm gonna share something that we're working on and that we're putting our hearts into right now. So what I'm gonna talk about today is AYA. So AYA is an open science initiative to accelerate multilingual progress. Um, and maybe I'll start by saying, who am I? So I lead Cohere for AI. So I lead Cohere's research team. And before that I was at Google Brain. So I met Teju back in the day when I was a brain in Nyeri, Kenya of all places, but I was at Brain for five years. I did a lot of research on efficiency, interpretability, robustness. I'm happy to talk about that as well. But now I lead our research team at Cohere for AI. And our team works on different efforts. Our goal is really to change where, how, and by whom research is done. But it's also to show that we can do this while also producing top tier research. So we have an open science initiative. So we have communities that are working together across institutions and we help provide compute and things like that. We have a full-time research staff and then we have this research scholar program. So if any of you are interested in this, it's also good to know about every year, we have an eight month paid, completely paid remote first opportunity to, to have your first research experience. So it's for rising stars um, in research, but it's for people who haven't published yet. So our goal is to support people just starting out. So um, this is our mission. We and it's hard. <laughs> yeah, I think part of why it's so nice to be here is to see other people who are also doing this mission, right, of changing how research is done. Um, this is our team. Um, this is our research scholars. Actually, Leke is also, yeah, so Leke was here this week. Many of you might have met him, but he's one of our research scholars as well. And today I'll talk about our open science initiative. So it's a space where anyone, you know, you have to fill out an application, but we we try and really support cross institutional collaborations. So as of May, we had 1,400 members. And so it's very special, like people apply from all over the world and then we accept. So I wanted to do this talk because this is what makes me grumpy. So right now, large language models are built by a small group of people. And I know a lot of them. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a very narrow group and they're coming from a very narrow set of places in the world. And I shared these, uh, these charts when we were in at the Indaba X this past week, I was giving a talk, but these are talks that really, these are charts that really drive me. So um, while the overall publications has decreased, truth producing research remains narrow. So I find this is so interesting because we have this spirally number of publications. Look at how sharp this is. But what we see is that certain types of collaborations happen more. So very often you see things between educational and nonprofits, but you don't things between educational and companies. But also there's major geographic disparities. So I think the craziest is Africa, so 1.06, but Latin America and the Middle East have big disparity in who participates in research. Um, and this is shaping who contributes to the ideas and the technology that's being made. So you know what's even more surprising is that some geographies have made recent gains, but I think what's interesting is Africa has stayed very flat. So we have to think really about how do we make sure that we are increasing opportunities everywhere. This is also reflected in who attends conferences. So 53% from North America 
And most striking, who participates is very narrow. So this is such a crazy chart. This is the number of what is deemed significant machine learning systems in the last, uh, really, 2002 to 2022. There's nothing from Africa that's attributed. This is the number of authors on those significant machine learning systems. So there's nothing there. So I think there's also compute trends, which amplify the disparity of who participates. So academia really finds that hard because of a compute gap. So it's really hard to contribute in different ways. But so why am I talking about Project Aya today? Because especially when technology is powerful, I think it's important. I was at Kipu a few weeks ago. So Kipu is in Uruguay. Uh, Kipo is this venue where they bring together all the Latin American research talent. So similar to how many amazing conversations happened this week at ICLR, Kipo is very special in the same way. And we had the same conversation because their researchers are also trying to figure out how do we make sure that we have not this gap in who builds this technology. So because he said this this week as part of one of his talks, but I thought it was very special this. It's like when you're not part of the conversation, it happens to you and not with you. So how do we build technology for everyone? So this is how I'm thinking about it. So I like this quote a lot. It says, the limit of my language means the limit of my world. I think right now there are big challenges in terms of representation of languages in, in our technology. So there's 7,000 languages in the world, but 2,000 have fewer than 1,000 speakers. What's crazy is languages are also not treated equally by research. So for example, my mom speaks Irish. She's from Ireland. She speaks Gaelic. Um, Gaelic is spoken by 0 0.2 million speakers, but it has 5,000 papers per million speakers. Then you see something like Hausa, where you have 70 million speakers, but only 1.5 papers per million speakers. So this is crazy. And this reflects who, what researchers are allocating resources towards, but not the actual distribution of the needs of who's speaking the languages. So. What's even interesting is that if you look at our multilingual models that are well known, like Bloom, MT5, XGLM, these are generative models. So they generate. This is the latest technology that's really powerful. Look at the number of languages trained on. So 46, 101, 30. MT5 was the most impressive, but it's only 100 languages. So why have some languages been left behind? So a lot of it, I think, is because where our data comes from. So a lot of the data for these big trainings comes from the internet, which means that the composition of languages who's used the internet influences what it's trained on. So for me, this is one of the craziest facts. So 5% of the world speaks English at home, yet 60% of the internet is written in English. And we see that as well with these biases towards other languages. So the share of the internet versus the share of actual speakers is often super different. And what we see is that under-resourced languages may have very limited data available. So an astounding 80% of the languages have no text available. Only 1,400 languages have text. When you think about that, is that not crazy? That out of the 7,000 languages, only 1,400 have any text available. So that's the challenge that we have, because it's not just how do we model language, it's like, how are we gonna incorporate other data sources? Can we incorporate audio? Can we incorporate other ways that people communicate if there's no written tradition? And that what that really means is that 80% of languages have very little text or few text. And so we only have a tiny fraction of languages that actually have text representation. So we also have challenges with data quality. So I'm just setting the scene here. I know it sounds quite gloomy, <laughs> but I think it's important to motivate what we're going to talk about next, which is why we want to do this project. So the data that's available is really low quality. So this is actually work by Julia Kritzer, other collaborators. So I, if some of you are Masakani, you may know Julia um, and others on this paper, but it's a very interesting paper. It's analyzing automatically curated data sets and actually human auditing it to check the quality. And what they find is, is that there's under 50% correct sentences, that the pairing that was automatic was not, the, was not good, or maybe difficult to generalize from. So I'm sure some of you have, have heard of this data set or used it. This is widely used for many languages because it's based on Jehovah's Witnesses, and they translate it into many languages. And so it's one of the few 
cross language corpora that we have for many low resource language. It's also a uh, religious text. So this means if we try and then generalize and apply it to medicine, it's hard. Sometimes the, the way that it's trained doesn't work for other very different programs. I also think it's really important to talk about the fact that we have this co-occurrence of limited data and limited compute. So where we typically see limited data, we also see very high cost of compute. So for example, if you look at Germany, it's very high resource. It's also very low cost of compute, of, of gigabytes of memory. The cost that is normally produced is quite cheap as a percentage of monthly income. So when you see someone like Nigeria, it's much higher. So there's this interesting thing that researchers who are already working in low resource data circumstances also base limited compute. So this was work led by Areva Iyer. So she's now a PhD student at the University of Washington. Tej is smiling. She's, yeah, we're, we're, she's a good friend of both of ours, but this was really lovely work and she terms this the low resource double bind. So this was published at EMNLP. So that's our goal. Our goal is that no language should be left behind. And I think it's a great time to work on this problem. Why? Because we're in currently an exciting time for large language modeling research. So this is actually um, a research model that is hosted on a mobile API, so I can text it. So I said, oh, I'm giving a talk about large language models. Like, why, what I, why is this exciting? And you can see it generates something very fluid, really exciting. It's very, um, uh, it's a very exciting time. People have connected with this technology and you have probably played with a chatbot of some kind. You probably played with Coheres this week because in some ways it's really powerful. Um, I can even say, what do we, what should I do when I'm in Rwanda and it will give me suggestions. And this all builds on this recent breakthrough, which is, you know, things like the transformer, which really made a big difference in how we can model and represent languages. So actually Aiden is on this paper. So Aiden's one of the founders of Cohere um, and actually was at the Deep Learning Endeavor a few years ago. That's where he met Teju. Um, and transformers were a breakthrough because they allowed us to model much longer text sequences. So you could go from something which could only have a short window of context to a much larger window. And that's what's led to it being one of the most popular building blocks of all times. So um, what I think is what we see now is a great acceleration, some trends, some breakthroughs. So one is a growth in the size of networks, but, and this characterizes both NLP and vision. And this is largely because we see big gains for this. So we see when we increase the size, we end up with big gains. But we also uh, see that it appears to create different capabilities in the models. There's also been changes of optimization. So typically you would fine tune on a single task and then you would have like a model per task. Now we've moved to something where we pre-train on the internet and we do that because we learn general features and then we create Instead of creating a custom model, which is what we used to do, we instead train on multiple tasks at once, so many different tasks. And this has been a big breakthrough. It transitions from having a single model per task to many different models. And then we've also seen changes in data. So we have this zero-shot performance. So two changes have happened. We've structured fine tree data as questions and answers. So we'll talk about this because I want to get your feedback on the IA project and how we're structuring it. And then we're integrating human feedback about preferences. So when I say we're structuring data as questions and answers, it means this. So you know you can structure it as an instruction or a question, and then it will generate a response. And what that's done is really improve performance. It tends to like lead to much better behavior. However, it requires a much larger model. So there's this tension where you have to go larger to take advantage. Um, and so we we've seen a lot of breakthroughs. So it's it's almost, it's a timely moment to figure out how can we make these breakthroughs apply to the rest of the languages? Because almost the entirety of the research has focused on English. So there's been very limited treatment of multilingual. So the very few, papers that have come out. So one paper came out in December, uh, in November of last year. This was released. So uh, actually, so the, the first author is now working with us on IM. So this is amazing. This was an important first step, but it actually just took the data, some of the data that was there, threw it in. And so this is an important first step in this direction, but in some ways, there's a lot of ways to go. So what they saw is that when they did this, then they added instruct style data for multilingual, they did see gains in performance. So you see things like this. This is um, this is the MT0. Let's see. Yeah, this is MT0. So you see these bumps from doing the instruct style. But 
the data sets they added only covered 46 languages and had no human feedback optimization. What does this mean? I think there's plenty of low hanging fruit for us to actually build something meaningful and to really push the technology. So we should add human feedback. We should have speakers from all over the world be able to contribute to their languages. We should, we should audit the quality of existing data sets because a lot of what was thrown in is not necessarily good quality. And we should explore data augmentation strategies. So what is Project Aya? This is what I would love to get your feedback on today. Um, and also, if you want to continue this journey, I know you just did this hackathon, but if this piques your interest about language, you should join the you know, research community and you can continue to engage with us if you're interested. But also, if you're not, if you, <laughs> it's okay too. <laughs> Um, so we're a 10-month community-wide project to improve generative models for multilingual. So we're at month three. We've done a lot of work, but there's a lot more to be done. And what the goal is, is to release research artifacts at the end. So to really release this back to the community. And it's a multi-institutional effort. So from industry, academia, nonprofits, independent researchers, the computers provided by us, because these are large-scale models that we need to train but there's over a hundred countries represented in our community. And so we see it as an opportunity to really support contributions from all over the world. So this is Aya, this is the UI that we've been working on. And so even today, I would love to get your feedback. I'll share with you the link and then please let me know if you, you know, for the next hour or so I'll be around. If you wanna stress test and give me feedback, let me know. So it's a, this is, so this, this UI, there's almost multiple teams. This UI project was built by Harum, uh, Freddie, and uh, really Sebastian German, who's a researcher. Uh, so each, each team, we have cross-institutional mentors, as well as uh, researchers who want to gain experience and want to, you know, work on a project. But this UI was a labor of love because we started out and we're just, you know, we're just people getting together across institutions to put something together. But it's really lovely. So it allows, we're still testing it. It's only <laughs> desktop friendly, but that's why I think it's a good time to start to get feedback from everyone. And what we're doing with the UI is we're trying to things like we want to help support things like, oh, you know, let's tally things by language. Let's have leaderboards where people can see who else is contributing in their language. So, you know, step by step, small things, but we'll see how we do. Uh, and then this is Aya. We call it Aya because Aya means fern. So it's a symbol of endurance, independence, defiance against difficulties, and resourcefulness. And we believe that's what this project is. So it's not, our project is actually all over the world. There's so many languages. It's Latin America, where I was a few weeks ago. It's really uh, parts of Asia. Even very, like the long tail of languages, the truth is most languages are not well represented. So this really is a global effort and we believe it's step by step because it takes so much work to do this. So how can you get involved? So I think this is really um, when I talked to Teju about what might be interesting for us to chat about today, I thought this might be one thing. So if you wanna continue, I know you may have learned things this week during this hackathon, or you may have just been at the conference, but if you wanna get involved and continue to engage in research, let me know. So there's three ways. So one is um, we need feedback. Our UI is, you know, it's moving, <laughs> but it's built by a group of volunteers. So we need feedback. Um, and so please, I'll send the link after this. And I would love whoever wants to try it for the next hour, give me feedback. That's great. Yeah, there's plenty. And if you do want to give feedback, just let me know and I'll add you to our Discord so I can add you to where, you know, it would be um, yeah, Harum and uh, Oshan and Freddie, I'm sure will be super grateful. Um, and then uh, there's also opportunities to get involved. We have a team four, so we have four teams. Team four, uh, we we kind of um, actually purposely make it uh, something that if you don't have as much time, but you want to get involved, you can give a little bit of time here and there. So if you have less bandwidth, then that might be a good team, but we also have a regional lead role. So Aisha is, I don't know how many of you know Aisha. She actually um, was a Mila. She's a researcher. She's from Egypt. So she's actually one of our regional leads, but we're doing these regional sprints where 
we really help support for like a concentrated effort of like let's improve the representation for this region so Aisha's taking the lead there but if anyone's interested we definitely um need more help and that's working directly with me and a few other researchers and we have European leads we have Latin American leads and we have leads from Asia we don't have leads from the North America we didn't think like <laughs> feels covered <laughs> So, um, but we have for everyone else. So it's also a good opportunity to meet researchers from other parts of the world who care deeply about these topics because all the leads will work together um, and it's gonna be like a global effort. So yeah, and this is an open science project. What does that mean? Our goal is to release the data set at the end. So we are just helping to support with compute and our research resources and mentorship. But like the goal is really, this is important and it's important for researchers everywhere to have access to this type of data set. So, so that is it. I am happy to pause. What I will say is I think I've left us plenty of time. Great. So I'm actually happy to take a broader, oh, I'm actually hope, happy to take a broader step back. So I talked about Aya, but I'm also just happy to chat about whatever you want to chat about, whether it's research careers, whether it's like 